right, and last but not least, let's talk about Cruella, right? Um, this is the newest Disney live action film to basically be uh, either a remake or a prequel to an existing, you know, film, right? So in this case, it is the classic 1961 film 101 Dalmatians, which still remains one of my all-time favorite, uh, you know, traditional a- a- animated films from Disney, right? I actually, well, funny thing is, like, you know, before you even met up online, I actually, like, rewatched the film, you know, right after, well, so so this is, like, nice. a day after watching Cruella, just to see the comparisons there. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, this this is what it led up to, and this is cool, and stuff like that, right? But yeah, I will confess though, like um, I'm not overly, overly, overly big on the original film, right? Although I do love it, like I mean, it's, it's still a, a great film, right? Just a masterpiece, masterpiece of my opinion. But the reason why I'm bringing this up though is because, like, when we heard about Cruella, I was losing my mind and going nuts, like, oh my god, we get the Cruella backstory that we always wanted to see, right? Uh, just to get this out of the way, yes, Cruella de Vil is still one of the greatest uh, animated villains in, in film history, right? Just, you know, a barter, like, there's there's no denying that, right? But yeah, I mean, you rule know, of, we saw the rule of, thumb, rule of thumb for Disney villains, the smaller the stakes, the more evil they are. I know, right? <laughs> uh, she, she, she just want to make a quote. Yeah, she just want to make a quote. Yeah, oh, she quote. Make a quote. That's, that's she wants to make the best quote. The best quote. Uh, I mean, she has, like, quote. 99 you know, Dalmatian pups, so, I mean, I mean, right? <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> just just kidding here. But yeah, uh, yeah, she is still one of my, one of my favorite uh, villains, I would say, film villains ever. Uh, just everything about her, just how crass and just how little of a shit she gives, you know, even by 1961 standards, I just absolutely love, right? Um, I will confess, though, that, uh, yes, I did see the 1996 version, the live-action version, when it came out, actually, in theaters, right. uh, I believe it was close to Christmas time it came out, right? Mm-hmm. I don't know what mm-hmm. possessed me to see it. I think it was because it was one, it was live action. Two, it was. We, we, we began to, to really see Cruella Deville like, in live action. I think that was his cell. Um, and she, she was played brilliantly, I would say, by, by Glenn Close, right? And yeah, mm-hmm. up to that point, I mean, it was like, nah, nobody could, could really touch her. Because, yeah, I mean, as forgettable, admittedly, as that movie was, I honestly have not watched that show since I saw it. I was meaning to, to watch it over for Cruella, but I just didn't get any time. Um, Glenn Close is still the best thing about that film, bad yeah. I didn't even watch one or two, 102 Dalmatians, because, like, well, was the point? I, at, the, at, at the time, it would mean young me just didn't really care for unneeded Disney sequels. So, like, I didn't need to watch Mulan 2. I didn't need to watch Aladdin 2. I was just like, all right, we have the oh, first yeah. one. I didn't even bother watching Lion King 2 or one no, no, and a half. Yeah, I, yeah, I, the, the, I, the, the, mid, the mid-90s the mid was around down, down swing for Disney in terms of them sequels and things. That, that's straight to, straight to video bullshit. Yeah, so, I, I just avoided only, those for years. So. Mm-hmm. Only, only Aladdin 3 was pretty good. I thought that was actually, like, quite There was a 3? I'm, I'm yeah, sorry, yeah. this is new. I, 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 oh, no, yeah, yeah. The third, I know Return of Jafar. No, right, that's the second one. But the third one's yeah. pretty good. That's, that's where they, they got back Robin Williams. And oh, they actually had like a really solid story. You get to meet Aladdin's dad, and it's actually like a really great reveal who Aladdin's dad is. Like, oh, it's, it's actually a solid, solid sequel. Um I have to keep what it was. I, if I remember okay. correctly, Lion, Lion King 2 wasn't that bad either, but it was still a set of bullshit compared to the first, so it was like whatever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But yeah, most most of those, it's a most cash of those grab. Yeah, most of those sequels were pretty bad. But you the B sequels is total nonsense. Like I can't believe somebody like actually work on that. Yeah, well, I, I will never waste my time on a sequel of <laughs> to that movie, right? But yeah, I mean, um, well, before, before, well, I want Tracy to do the synopsis for this one, right? So I've been fair to these live action films, right? Remakes, sequels, prequels, whatever, whatever you want to call it, right? I was fair towards Beauty and the Beast, right? I still have yet to see Cinderella, although that was really good. I still have yet to see Maleficent, although that was really good. Um, skipped on the sequel because I heard that was kind of bad. I could be wrong. Um, Mulan, I was fair towards, and then it's only like afterwards you kind of realize, well, wait, no, but um, this this could have been so much better though. But I don't know. You know, it was it was it was COVID times, and it was like, all right, well, we we watched it at home, so you know, I guess, right? 
So yeah, um, so not seeing that my expectations were were low for this movie, but I was curious. I was curious, uh, mainly because it was not just a backstory of Cruella Deville, but it was played by McGill Emma Stone, right? Uh, that's that's Ricardo Gill, because you know <laughs> we always make this joke uh, about her performance in uh, La La Land and how she didn't uh, she, how she didn't deserve the Academy the Oscar she won, but yeah, that that's another story for another day. But I mean, I I I've, I've enjoyed her films for the most part, right? And then also two. I always think that Emma is one of the. I, sorry, I was I was just saying I always think that Emma is one of the best Asian um, actors, right next to Scarlett Johansson for like her performance. <laughs> yeah, you know, because <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. that that whole film there where she was supposed to play what Polynesian. Um, yeah, Hawaiian. Hawaiian. I remember that. Yeah, yeah. And I was her. like, yeah, that's 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 brilliant. That's yeah. that's my Emma, one of the best car- Polynesian actresses around. You know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But um, last thing I'll say before, well, before you give us the synopsis, Tracy, right, is the tone of it that, that caught me by surprise, right? You know, this sort of dark tone, but it's set in, you know, 70s, Lon- uh, 70s London. So, you know, it's, you know, that, that punk period, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And it's like, okay, well, I'm just hoping that it wasn't going to be Disney trying hard to be this this edgy or edge lord kind of show. Like, ooh, we could be dark too. You know what I mean? That's, it's, not, it's not just limited to to to, to MCU or you know our Lucasfilm products, but we could also be dark with our films too. I mean, look at Maleficent, right? But in this case, it wasn't fantasy, right? You know what I mean? It's you know technically real stuff going on there. So. It's like, were they really going to like push that envelope, or re- are they really going to give us the PG thirteen goods, or was it just like, uh, well, you know, it's just dark because it just look and you know shot that way, but it's not really, really dark, right? But I'll answer that with with my thoughts in the film, right? But uh, Tracy, uh, synopsis on Cruella. What, what was it about? I'm I'm going to start off by giving you a quote from from Craig Craig Gillespie. Craig says to the Hollywood Reporter, he was saying. Um, at the at every production, as as every production head came in to join the film, this is from Disney. Um, he would immediately stop them and say, "We're not making a Disney movie. Don't think of it as a Disney film. Think of it as a coming of age punk story in London with grit." And then he would show them the images and that kind of stuff. Um, so that is kind of how Craig was able to sort of sell it to people who were, you know, not Bob Iger. Uh, in terms of the film. Cruella stars uh, Emma Stone from obviously, you know, Amazing Spider-Man and La La Land. And she is there in the role of Estella slash Cruella. Um, and Estella is, is, is you know, Estella has dreams of becoming a fashion success even from the time that she is small. There is the idea of Cruella who seems to be her, what I tend to call like her coping mechanism because of right. certain things that I said and that kind of stuff. For me, and I'll talk about this later on, but for me, this is kind of like her Sasha Fierce, like the way her Beyonce says right. when she goes up on stage, she does Sasha Fierce. Um, so it's 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 Emma Thompson who plays the Baroness. You also have Kirby Howell uh, Baptiste who plays um, Anita Darling, and I actually quite like the kind of interpretation of that. I wish there was a little bit more there. Mark Strong is in this film. Uh, he doesn't have like a front and center role, but he does have a bit of a pivotal role. Um, and then, of course, Joel Fry plays Jasper, and Paul uh, Walter Hauser plays Horace. So, what Cruella um, does, Cruella is somewhere in between a prequel and a reimagining. There are right. things, like I did not even, to be honest with you, I did not even know about the book. And it was only until like glamming up on all of the things that I found out that there was this book that was there in the 60s of Airbus. Um, and that is what inspired the actual animated film. And so the book has a little bit, a little bit more history on Cruella and like some of her, um, some of her family history, and even the idea of maybe Cruella's ancestors actually owning Hill Hall instead of Hellman Hall, that right. sort of thing. So there, there is some ties to it. Uh, I will tell you um, in terms of me being excited or not when um the d23 event came out and they showed that picture with uh, uh cruella is there with her three dalmatians and uh, horace and jasper is in the background i looked at it and i was like this could be fun but also we know that disney has a history of 
reimagining the villains. So your villains are now, they have souls and true love's kiss is what actually is going to bring, you know, Sleeping Beauty back to life through Maleficent, not the prince. You know, they, they, they have a way of turning these things around. So I was, I saw it and I was like, this could be interesting, but I wasn't 100% there until I started to see production shots. And then I started to see the, the well, I saw the first teaser trailer and that piece of music with who's sorry now and I was like I'm in this is the movie for me so <laughs> so I kind of started off there Cruella follows um, Estella who um, after some serious tragedy uh, in her life at a very young age she meets up with uh, Horace and Jasper Jasper seems to be the one who actually has a brain on his head from since the time he was very little and these three um, street urchins, if you will, they're there in 70s London, which is a kind of a, a crossroads section between hot couture vibes and very fashion senses. And then, of course, you also have the, the, the rise of punk rock sensibilities around that time. And so they're in the middle there and they're like thieves and, 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 and going about their lives. But she of herself wants to become... Uh, a fashion, she wants to start her own label, she wants to become a fashionista. Um, well, not a fashionista, but a fashion designer. Um, and then during the course of the film, we realize um, there is a reason for her to um, hate the Baroness. Right. And there is there is an actual reason why she hates the Baroness. And this is one, there's a small spoiler, there is this one thing that happens in there when she sees the first, when well, the first time she sees the Baroness wearing uh, a piece of jewelry that is very important to uh, Estella. And, you know, Estella shouts out, no, that's not what happened. And it's really Cruella starting to sort of push through. And so what the film does is that Cruella sort of becomes a separate personality that without it being sort of like disassociative disorder, Cruella is sort of like this personality that is used to um, be able to be confident and is able to seek revenge and is able to um, do all the things that she would do in a way without the total conscience that an Estella would have, which at some parts of it uh, lends itself to a bit of chagrin to the to the two um, to the, to her two guys because they sort of feel like if you know they're just there for the for the for the ride. They're not actually you know like she's being mean, but. I really, um, I really, really and truly enjoyed how they actually uh, took this, how they took this film, and what they intend, what they tried to do with it. Because, like I said, it's an, it's, it is an, inter an interesting intersection between, okay, this is a uh, lead up to Glenn Close, who actually is an executive producer on this film. Okay, um, that's right. That was so. So from the time I saw Glenn is actually executive producer on this as well, I was like, okay, cool. So this is like a seal of approval. She's somehow involved and obviously making a couple, you know, dollars off of it. Um, so it's a little bit leading up into that, and you can see shades of that. So she doesn't go full. I'm going to kill all animals just yet, but you can see the creeping up to it. But it's also a kind of a very cool um, reinvention of the Cruella mythos. The idea of even how they changed um, Anita and Roger coming on towards the end, those were not the original, obviously, the original Anita and Roger. So it lends itself now that they can expand on this and maybe do a Disney series. They can do um, Cruella 2, and that might actually be a little bit more uh, where she starts to get a little bit more evil. Um, so that's just me rambling on. But basically what I would say is that it is delicious in my mind it is delicious it is decadent the fashion is fantastic and the music of itself does absolute wonders um for it and if i could just throw this one last bit out about glenn close there is a there's a line in 101 Dalmatians that always cracks me up is uh when anita tells her that she would leave the the studio to if she you know found up a, a guy and and they got married and they had other plans and and cruella says to her more women have been lost to marriage than famine and war combined and i <laughs> always like wow you know points were made <laughs> points were made and when you see how she operates in terms of even her relationship of like pushing jasper to the side and pushing horace to the side in order to achieve the revenge that she wants to achieve you can see that if they decided to go down a literal route 
with the Glenn Close angle, um, how she would eventually end up there. Uh, basically, I had fun. It's going to be one of those movies that I'll be watching over again, and we will continue talking about it. All right. Well, Ricardo, thoughts on Cruella? Okay, so, yeah. I clearly don't like this film anywhere near as much as, uh, yeah. <laughs> as, as Tracy does. But, uh, yeah, I, I think it's... it's Okay, so I say it, to me, it's kind of trash, but very well-made trash. Um, I loved the, again, costume design. Costume is excellent. Set design is excellent. Um, actors, everybody was good in this. Emma Stone was great in this. Emma Watson was great in this. Um, the needle drops, all these great needle drops they had. They, you know, they have a bunch of fantastic tracks and songs. I think they had Nina Simone and it's like, what? And, you know, this reference to this and this, this a lot of great London and punk song music. And it's like, oh, it's tracks, tracks dropping. And the actual narrative itself doesn't work at all for me. And because of that first 10 minutes, what happens within the first 10 minutes is so silly and so stupid to me. And I just couldn't stand it. But I was like, all right, I'm going to go through the rest of this. And it's, it's all right. It, it does an interesting kind of narrative of, of Devil, Devil uh, with his Devil Wears Prada, but a kind of a revenge story and a kind of a mm-hmm. sneaking thing. And they do, they make it work with interesting dynamic. But I just found it is one of these things that just seems wholly unnecessary. It's, it's I mean, if it makes money, but it, it, it kind of, kind of the, the whole well of that argument is kind of poison now. But I get a feeling that it's one of those things that just, um, I forget which critic make that joke, but it is, you could, as I say, you could see, you know, the, the, the area of sections of top, um, hot topic being built in real time. Like that's, it, that's the only purpose of this. It's just a kind of a certain aesthetic and a certain demographic that it's catering to. And it caters to that aesthetic and demographic really hard. Uh, to, to, borrow, to borrow from a, I don't know if anybody will get this joke, but it's basically Disney leaning in. That's what it is. It's Disney leading in. If you understand that reference, congrats. You're smart. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, I, couldn't, um, I couldn't get into this one as much as, as the thing. But again, I'm not into any of the live action movies. All of them kind of fail for similar reasons, right? And for their own unique reasons in some ways. This one is fine. Like it does its own thing. As I say, if you don't think about it as a Corella story or just as, as a complete reimagining, it's fine. It works with, with, with what it is. Think of it as like a Male- Maleficent thing and it's, it's, it works for what it does. But uh, I kind of put it to the camp of kind of trash. I had fun for the, for, for the most part. That is mostly because the actors hold up the material for what it is. All right. Well, I'm going to see something a little, a little controversial, right? Um, I was really underwhelmed by the musical choices here. Okay. I'm going to explain why. I'm going to explain okay. why. Yes. Song choice. The, the, the songs themselves. I mean, they, they, they hits, right? They, they, they slaps, right? But... I mean, if you've seen like 10 or 15 films over the course of your life, when these songs come up, it's like, oh yeah, but this was in this movie. This was in that movie. Like when I hear these boots are made for walking and stuff like that, I'm like, right. all right, but I heard this before. Like I, I, I get the context of it, but okay. So so for me, right, I don't want to spend, spend too long on the music stuff right when it comes to stuff like say like uh when it comes to like say tarantino for example right not, not comparing craig gillespie to quentin tarantino right but his music drops to is like wow like it's either the songs that you just haven't heard before or stuff that you haven't heard in ages and they haven't been used in 10 15 20 films i felt like nearly every song that was dropped in this movie you've heard before in some way shape or form yeah. in either some movie or ref or or, right. or sample in some rap song like the nina simone stuff right. i'm just there like all right i understand it's the the, the time but it just felt like this it, it felt basically like um like a like a top like a billboard top 20 right. list basically this cobbled from youtube like oh you're looking for a playlist yeah there's there's your playlist and that, we, that's what we get to we, ju- we just right. had a movie with, with pretty bad needle drops in my opinion but it had kind of the same needle drops but it's only because i just like the songs in this more that is army you're dead right i mean same same problem yeah right yeah. but that's that that's not to say that the music um didn't add any uh, wasn't well, it was put uh, had no purpose, right? Like it was there, and it it, it add to the scenes that they were used. But for me, I just felt they could have dive a little deeper into that vinyl collection and find some some really like like really like, like just some more like more classic shit now, not just stuff like I've heard millions of times before. But that's just me, right? 
Also, I would say that because I am not overly invested in the world of of One Jump One Animations, like I, I said, like I love the original um, animated film, but I wasn't like excited as hell for this. Um, I saw it and I was like, "This is fine." Like I I liked it for what it was, right? Um, the funny thing is for me though is that I just couldn't help but notice some allusions, intentional or unintentional, that's up to you, to DC films. Like, I saw a bit of The Dark Knight. I saw a little bit of Batman Begins with a certain uh, moment involving um, a, a certain dress, that's all you'll see. I uh, saw a bit of Joker, you know what I mean, with, with right. you know, Estella, Estella's transformation into um, Cruella and, you know, the personal aspect behind it. Um, I even saw a little bit of Batman Returns, too, in terms of a certain name of a certain place being changed to something way more devilish, that's all you'll see. And I was like, so that's what I made this joke on Facebook. Like, this is like the, D- the, Dis- the Disney DC movie that nobody asks for, but we got anyway, right? Yeah, I just couldn't help but feel like, okay, they just pull from the DC playbook. And, oh, like, let's, this is how you make this story dark. Ah, we do this, we do that, right? But I won't lie, though, um, it, it did entertain me, right? I'm sure it's, it's run time. I would confess also, too, that it does run a tad bit too long, though. I mean, 2 hours and 40 minutes. 14, sorry. <laughs> I felt it could have been a little bit shorter. That's not seeing that they were, um, you know, padding or anything like that. But I just felt that it was a little too long for, for its own good, right? Um... Emma Stone, I thought that she was she was great as um, Estella. I mean, she once again proves why she's one of the best actresses in the game right now. Um, and I did buy her as, you know, Cruella as well. So I, I, I dug the back and forth thing. The opening, like, establishing into, you know, why she looks the way she does is silly. You know what I mean? Like, you know, well, it, it's is, not, it is it's really... Not that is, is the cause of what, her relation with Dalmatians. What right, that? right. Yeah, and yeah. Well, well, that too as well. Yeah. It is, it is, it is, it is really, really silly, though. <laughs> but I imagine for like I don't know, diehard fans of of the of the movies themselves, it might turn them off, though. But I mean, I mean, like, look, I was just going into the story. It's like, okay, this is your vision. This is what we get. Okay, so I was like, all right, well, this is what we're gonna go with. Fine, right? Um, but I don't want to say she's outshined by her, but she's kind of outshined by Emma Thompson. Sorry to say. Okay. And I think <laughs> she delivers the best performance in this whole movie where, as the Baroness. She just steals every scene that she's in. She is just so deliciously bad and just <laughs> so, like, just doesn't care about anybody, Jen. And just that bougie about her, I love as well. I love there's this particular moment involving her and a teaser and a bottle yes. of perfume. The happy crack. <laughs> I was like, cause, cause, you know, like, it's not like saying that she's gonna do something totally evil and like shoot somebody in kneecaps or anything like that, right? But for somebody like her, it's like, yes, this is something that someone in her position would do. <laughs> and it and I wouldn't doubt. I love that. I wouldn't doubt if there are real people. Or I mean, like real rich people who find the pleasure um, in doing that kind of shit. So yeah. Yeah, and I just love how I just love the the, the how both the Baroness and Estella were just button heads, right? You know yeah. what I mean? And although, then, yeah. although one time, although uh, again DC again, I was picking up on a bit of Batman Superman vibes where it's like you know the person that you're looking for is right in front of you, but you don't know is that person because glasses and a wig. I mean. Right. You know, right, right. It had like a lot of like little, little funny beats in it. I felt like you know, it had this one little part with a banana, a banana slice, little stuff like that. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was kind of gross, but I, I loved it. But it's very gross, <laughs> but I, I thought it was hilarious. So it was like, oh, that, that's that's actually pretty funny for what it is. It's stuff yeah, like yeah. That. yeah. Um, I, I do, I do like how they how they rework um Jasper and Horace. You know what I mean? So that, that was cool. Like, you know, they, they started off as, you know, just grifters and then, well, they, they eventually they become, you know, almost like a family. Like, like I like that. Yeah. They're not just thugs yeah. that the Cruella hired, like in the old film, right? So that was interesting. Um, <laughs> the Anita Darling thing was like, all right. So that was like a, that, that was a deep cut, clearly. You know what I mean? Like, it's a character that, that well, okay, so Anita, they, they invent, um, is is a different, is a reworking of the character from, you know, the, mm-hmm. the old film, right? 
But you know the Anita Darling part, because the Darling is her surname, right? It's only when I rewatched the, the old film, I was like, oh, okay, okay, that's right. that's what you're going for with the Darling. Okay. Okay, I see you, I see you. Um, same thing with, with Roger, right? Who in this show is a lawyer, but surprise, surprise, he yeah. eventually becomes the guy who, you know, creates the, you know, does he Cruella de Vil song like what we saw in the in the old films, right? So I thought that was, that was really cool as well, right? All right. Also, I I do like the inclusion of the character Artie. I remember some people were like, "Oh my God, you know, I mean an LGBT cute character, first time ever in Disney history." Well, Disney fourth, life fourth, history, fourth, live action fourth, history. Fourth, and I'm like, um, no, like you know, they did this with you know yeah. that that Beauty and the Beast remake, right? Just seeing, right? Yeah, but like actually, yeah, we we don't talk about that because if you go to if honestly, and this is the problem I have with Disney and Lucasfilm, if you are going to do a thing. Do a thing. Yeah, don't a... don't give me thirty seconds of a kiss at the end of Rise of Skywalker, or give me a guy who you know he finds himself towards the end as he transforms, you know, into the full gown in Beauty <laughs> and the Beast. Give if you're gonna give me, give me an actual character. Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. So I like how just right off the bat, you know, he is, you know, he his his character. I love how he works into Cruella's plan for revenge. That's all you see. Um, and it works, right? And yes, he, he owns his fashion shop, right? So speaking of, um, you know, well, actually, you know, helps out in terms of that, right? Speaking of fashion, yes, the costume design is on point. Um, if there's one Oscar nomination the show must get is in that department, though, because, yeah, they really went out of the way to just come up with these really fabulous costumes, um, not just with um, Estelle, but also with the Baroness, though. Like, I felt like every scene that she was in, she was just rocking some really, really dope, right? Um, mm-hmm. And, yeah, I mean, this is coming from somebody who's not really into costume design, though, but I love it when it when it works well in a film, especially in a period piece like this, right? Um, also, there's a... There's, uh, very Lady Gaga-ish moment involving um, a, a garbage truck. And I was yes. like, all right. Yes, that's in the trailer. All so right, movie. All right, movie. Okay, I like that. I like that. I like that. I like that. I like that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I felt like, especially in the second act, though, the sort of transformation from Estella to Cruella was a little rough. Um, it, it, it involves this particular... Um, concert that's all you'll say this particular showcase like i felt like it was like it could have played out a little bit better though but i do like how it kind of comes back to haunt her like you know i mean um becoming this different person but you know eventually she once a certain reveal is dropped is like okay well i guess i must be this way because i'm destined to be this way so i i I like it even though it is a little kind of rough like i felt they could have developed that a little bit more like not go into joker territory and just go all in and really explain why Arthur Fleck becomes joker but still even with a movie like this like i know it's technically for for you know a family film they could dive in a little little, little more deeper so we really feel that that um that transition or or i should say that back and forth basically right um what else quickly before before i wrap up uh, the, the the set pieces. I, I thought that the set pieces were really cool as well. I like the that they try to go for this sort of high stuff, like this kind of crime grifter kind of thing. But it's not exactly a crime film. It's not a comedy, even though it it has dark humor. But it's not like an overly com um comedic film. And it has your dramatic moments, but it's not really a dramatic film. So I like how they just kind of balance all three genres. Um, also production design, like the world of you know that that early seventies London worked for me. It it yeah. really felt really lived in and stuff like that. Um, even like the 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 the, the dogs themselves, because yes, we have some dog side characters as well too. Uh, worked like I like I dug the, the villainous Dalmatians and the the two heroic dogs as all we'll see who work with um with Jasper and, and, and Horace, right? Horace. Which is a huge step up from the way how they were in the old film, right? So, so I like that. And yeah, um, just as I keep mentioning the, the old film, there's like these really clever callbacks to the film. Case in point, the crazy quote-unquote way how Cruella drives in this movie here, you know, it oh echoes what we saw there in the <laughs> old film. Um, and, you know, it's just all these little smart calls which, which work, right? But again, you know, me because I'm not too entirely emotionally driven by the material, I... Like, I wouldn't go out of my way to say, well, you know, you're, you're just bastardizing the old film and it doesn't feel like the old film. Like, no, it's not supposed to be like the old film. It's supposed to be its own thing, right? And um, also have to give credit to Craig Gillespie, though, for really making a really slick, very well shot looking film, though. I'll, I'll give him that, though. 
Um, but at the end of the day, you know, I mean, the question will be asked if there is a reason for this movie to exist. Um, I would say too is just re- reimagining old characters that you know and love. I think it works for the most part though, but still it's just like, well, it's there. I'm not gonna fight this movie down and say, well, you know, this movie is just a utter abomination, you know, and why do we need to see these prequels? Nobody cares about the backstory of Cruella, but I mean, it's it's there, right? So that's how I saw it. It's there, it's fine, I watched it, I liked it, uh, way more than I expected. Didn't love it, though, um, and it just mainly is just because, you know, of just how familiar the story all feels at the end of the day. Like, yes, you see these story beats, and it's like, yeah, seen this before. Even right down to the music, as I said before, heard this before, you know what I mean? But in terms of like this reimagining, reimagining of this character, it's 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 interesting. It's, it's quite interesting. Yeah. And last thing I want to say before we get to Tree, he's thoughts. Well, quick thoughts on the show. Um, I hear Tree the Grave right now. We're supposed to be getting a sequel slash prequel to um to Cruella. So it's like Cruella two, but they want to do like a Godfather Part two kind of vibe where you're seeing present and past and stuff back and forth. So maybe there they might explain why she hates, why she really wants to go to a way to get those, um, you know, those Dalmatians like we what we saw in the original film. Maybe I don't know, but that um, might be why why that might be why Glenn is is attached to this as a producer. It might if, yeah. if that's the real truth, then yeah, that perhaps perhaps that, yeah, yeah. So I mean, not not excited to see that, but you know, it'll be it'll be interesting, right? And and I'll shut up here. Um, no, it does not go as dark as you think it does. Like, well, I guess maybe if you're like really, really serious, um, like no, you you want to one damage this, um, you know, source material, then yeah, you could pick up on the dark stuff in it. But I just kind of watch it like, no, it's not edgy, it's not edge lord, it's just you know, dark when it needs to be, but not overly dark. Like, you know, you could kind of watch it. You know what I mean? It it it's safe, it's fine. Like, I could see. You know, well, maybe kids. Well, pro- kids well, probably wouldn't get freaked out by it, but just probably what what's being implied. Maybe they might get freaked out of that. But on that though, it's a fine movie. I mean, it did that didn't come out of it like you know this was a waste of my time or anything like that. Um, it's probably not a show I will go back to in a hurry though. But you know, as far as you know, these live action Disney films, yeah, this is this is one of the more admir- ad- admirable efforts. That's that's all I'll say. See ya, um, Tracy. Um, quick thoughts on the show, and then you could get to written, and then we'll jump in with our ratings. Okay, cool. Um, well, I'll I'll take this time to just throw these uh, things out. <clears throat> um, so for me, like th- usually, there is that comparison between uh, Devil Wears Prada and uh, Joker. But what I right. what I kind of feel in terms of like, especially where Devil Wears Prada is, Devil Wears Prada is one hundred and one Dalmatians is Cruella. So, yeah. like, when I, I, like, for example, that opening shot where uh, Miranda comes uh, to, the, to the magazine. And so the, the, the car comes up to the corner and the, comes out and she walks out and she has her big coat and her hair is all white because Miranda Priestley and how everybody is. That is legitimately the Baroness, one. And then, two, that is the very first time that we see Glenn Close as uh, a Cruella coming out with that coat coming off. So Devil Wears Prada is sort of, in a very weird sense, very much 101 Cruella, 101 Damnations, 101 Cruella, 101 Damnations, and that sort of feeds back into Cruella. So for me, it's kind of like a symbiotic relationship there. Um, The thing that I was kind of worried about moving in is Cruella has a kind of a high British vibe to her um, in terms of her accent. When you have American, when you have British actors playing American roles, they have an easier way to fall into British twang. Um, but when you have American actors, you end up sometimes with what I call the Juliism, you know, Lara Croft and the tourist. There's a kind of way that an American actor will sound to sound British. Um, and I didn't get that problem here with with Estella slash Cruella, Emma Stone's version of it. I was like, that is fine. I am done with that. Uh, the music for me, I, like, I, you know me, I tend to collect uh, soundtracks before films come out because I like, what I like to do is that I like to play it and imagine 
where exactly it lies in it. So the two soundtracks are there because there's the original score. Um, I can't remember the person. I think it's Nicol, Nicholas, Nicholas, Nicholas Bret, Bretel. Um, yeah, who who he mentioned, uh, well, Ricardo and I mentioned doing the, the score for the Underground Railroad, still the best show uh, of mm-hmm. 2021 thus far. Go on. So there's that, there's 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 the score album, and the score album is very cool. But then also in terms of this um, various artists album, I quite liked it. I was kind of annoyed, and this is my this is my one of two annoyances. I was kind of annoyed that um, they didn't put all the music in there. Like there is a song from, I can't remember the name of the old band, I think they're called the Zombies, um, but it's that song, Time, uh, it's the time of the season for loving. Yeah, they, they, and they, they, they played it in that. the movie. Yeah. Mm. They had it in the movie, but they, I was like, wait, no, I, I don't remember this anywhere in my soundtrack. Why is this not in my soundtrack? There are a few. Oh, well, to be fair, um, things like that do happen. Eh? They, they try to I mean, squeeze in songs last minute. So it's not in the official soundtrack, but it's in the movie it's, it's for fair. that reason. Yeah. What the, the reason for that for me, like, it's like Craig said, because Craig was doing an interview on uh, the music uh, um, for it, and he was saying, uh, he like when they were writing it and stuff like that there were musical bits that w- was coming to his head in terms of like because he always had his player you know these kinds of height stories of he always had his music player around so uh he would have it playing on on the set like even that whole there's a scene uh where estella makes her first bit of art right. so to speak um in in the showcase and um he said you know he had his phone there and he queued up these boots were made for walking because that was on his phone and he's, you know, that kind of tricky scene. So for me is if you have all these musical cues, then give me more of my Doris Day and give me um, the zombies, that kind of stuff. And the other thing uh, that I felt a little bit iffy about was the idea of, I feel like some parts could have been uh, left to breathe and some parts could have been edited a little bit better, but it wasn't something that was... Uh, that would have made me jump out of the film. Um, and so for me, watching this film, and I will be watching it again, um, <laughs> watching this film, I I really did, I, long story short, I really did enjoy it. I really quite liked it. And in terms of a rating, um, this, this really made me feel good. I mean, like, I have Dalmatian, I, I have Dalmatian masks, because if I have to go outside, I might as well. Um, so this really made me feel good. So I'm going to give it a nine, um, a nine out of, I'm going okay. giving it a nine out of 10. I, I will mm. throw this out. Finally, um, not every Disney live action I am here for or want to be here for. Like, for example, I am hearing a rumor that, um, Disney is planning on doing a live action story on the Wicked Stepsisters of uh, uh god what's her name uh cinderella because yeah, cause, cinderella cause has, everybody cause... wants to see that right i i mean like i could i could live with the idea of hearing oh okay the story you've been told about maleficent is not completely accurate the real story quote unquote i can deal with hearing oh this is why cruella is the way she is um but at the end of the day even the the, the real quote unquote real story of the stepsisters they have like birds coming and peck their eyes out because they're just pure evil i don't know if i need to see a story on them but where it comes to to cruella i quite enjoyed it it made me feel it made me feel happy so i'm like you know what? take a nine out of ten all right all right uh well ricardo um final thoughts and reason yeah um it's, it's one of these things that not not for me i'll admit um it doesn't really work uh for me because i, I just i just was just so annoyed by oh that's the reason why the thing and they probably gonna have to clean that up in some potential sequel as, as you guys mentioned um and it is very clumsy narrative wise, but I, I, because it's so well made, I, I, I have a problem with it. So, you know, it's it's really good cra- film craftsmanship at work. Um, admittedly, it does not appeal to me. That it's not for me, not my crowd. But it works um, for what it is. Um, yeah, when I'm thinking about it, um, it, it was a six at first, but I pumped after seven. It's not bad. All right. All right. Well, for me, I will give this uh, a light three and a half out of five, man. Um, I think it is worth checking out, but I will say that if this material isn't for you, if you just don't care for, if you never cared for the, for one hundred one animations or you know Disney films as a whole, then yeah, this is not gonna be for you. And yeah, there are people like that. Oh, there some people just generally just 
don't care for Disney films at all, right? Um, and they could care less about you know yeah. live action remakes and stuff, right? Yeah, I think the problem with the with the, with the um, live action Disney films, especially this, these ones in particular, is that they're trying to do the it's this cynical corporate. I don't want the term it is. It's kind of corporate wokeism, right? It's that, right? You need to have the girl boss, and well, I made my Disney my statement about Disney earlier. If you if you understand the reference, yeah. Disney leans in, right? Um, mm-hmm. That's <laughs> what it is. I mean, it's I want I I don't dismiss stuff for being cynical. Look, it's fucking Disney. It's super cynical. We know. But this just was like a bit too much for me. Um, but it, it because everybody is so good in it and it had a clear vision, I can't be mad at it. So it's like, all right, cool. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, this this could have played out way worse than it did do. But um, exactly. unfortunately, right. I mean, everybody came true and did the damn thing. I mean, from from Emma Stone to you know Emma Thompson to Craig Gillespie. You know, what I mean, just everybody just came true and did their thing, Tread. So. I mean, in the long run, people might question its relevance. Or I shouldn't say relevance. Like, it's meaning, like, d- did we really need to see the backstory of Cruella, right? But I would argue that, you know, people will remember the costumes. People will remember the costume, um, the production design. People will remember Emma Thompson, right? So uh, we, we get uh, we get some, some cool things out of it, right? So I'm not going to be that one to say, yeah, well, Cruella shouldn't exist because blah right it, it it's here right so take it or leave it watch it or don't watch it and i would say again if you are not a fan of this material if you don't care for it at all skip it but if you are curious so yeah you know if you absolutely love everything about one 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 john dalmatians and disney and stuff like that yeah give it a look man it won't hurt it won't hurt hey this is matthew bailey and i hope you've enjoyed this segment of the bs beats and bailey podcast if you'd like to hear the full episode hit up my link tree on the other side of my head are two videos you can check out like this video if you like it feel free to subscribe and hit the bell as well thanks for listening and until the next one take care peace